The ninth chapter of our text is entitled, God is One. The the Bible tells us that uh, our Lord, our God, is one Lord. There is one God. There is no other God. He's the only God. God's names include one, it's a name, clearly emphasizing His oneness, and Holy One. This chapter is the first of several that are going to focus on uh, not really attributes of God in a sense, or, but rather descriptions of God. We're going to see, look at the oneness of God, the three persons of God, the hierarchy of God. We're going to be looking at uh, the structure the, the, of, of God Himself. And this is the first one. We're looking at His oneness. But his oneness, like everything else about God, is something that cannot be seen, yet he wants us to see it. So God has created physical illustrations of his oneness to uh, emphasize or to teach us about his oneness in nature. They include, I believe, three things, at least three things in the biological world. The common building blocks of life, it's going to be the first thing we talk about here, and then also the similarities among organisms and biological systems. We'll talk about them in succession. Beginning with the common building blocks of life, we have this phenomenon that there are common monomers for all of the molecules of which organisms are made. Organisms are actually made of big molecules, macromolecules, Uh, simply refers to the fact that they're large molecules. If you compare the molecules that the sun is made of, that the earth is made of, that planets are made of, some of them can be fairly large molecules. Uh, Most of them are small. In the case of biological organisms, even if you're talking about bacteria, the molecules involved are huge. They're very much larger than any molecules found in the, in the non-biological world, in the, in the physical world outside of biology. Organisms, however, without exception, are made of these huge molecules called macromolecules. But interestingly enough, as large as those molecules are and as diverse and as how many different kinds there are of these macromolecules, they are actually built or constructed from a rather small number of small molecules known as monomers. So every macromolecule is made of a string of monomer molecules, small molecules of which they are are built. We're going to see that this is a really cool design, and it points to the fact that there is a single God who created all things. We're going to go through the major macromolecules of life. We're going to summarize them and put them into four categories. And we're going to look at the characteristics of the macromolecules in each of these categories. And in each case, we're going to determine what it is that is the monomer for building that particular kind of macromolecule. The first of the four categories of macromolecules we're going to look at are the carbohydrates. By the name carbohydrate, you can get an indication of what it is that they're, what it is that they are. Carbo would suggest carbon. Hydrate would suggest water. They are carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in a ratio of one to two to one. It's like having carbon, one mole- one atom of carbon, with two atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen. The ratio, if the ratio of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen is extremely close to 1 to 2 to 1, then it is a carbohydrate. The monomer from which all carbohydrates are built is a group of molecules known as the monosaccharides. Saccharin is, uh, or saccharis is a word that means sweet. Mono is a word that means one. So it's one sweet. It's uh, like one unit of sweetness. And 
that is the, that is the, uh, the molecule, the type of molecule from which all carbohydrates are made. Monosaccharides are molecules with five or six carbons. They are also sugars in all cases. So it's a five or six carbon sugar. Uh, there are a number of different kinds, but most of them are represented by glucose, is a six carbon sugar that is also known as blood sugar. If you, if you have to check your blood sugar or people with uh, diabetes have to check their blood sugar, they're checking the amount of glucose in their blood, a six carbon sugar that our body uses to build most of its macromolecules of carbohydrate. Galactose is another one of a common form of the monosaccharides. Fructose is another uh, monosaccharide. Uh, this is fruit sugar. This is the sweetness that you find in an apple or an orange or banana. Uh, fructose or honey. Honey is almost entirely fructose. The main purpose of the monomers themselves, glucose or fructose, uh, galactose is for energy storage. Those particular kinds of molecules can be broken down into smaller components and energy released from it. These molecules are built by putting energy into molecules, so these molecules have as their function, a uh, primary function, uh, storing energy or actually building the larger mm, carbohydrates. Another set of carbohydrates would be the disaccharides. So rather than mono, meaning one, monosaccharides, these are disaccharides, di meaning two, these are mono, uh, carbohydrates made of two mono, monomers of carbohydrate, two monosaccharides. Uh, the most common examples here would be sucrose, which is actually made of glucose and fructose put together, and that's known as table sugar. That's the sugar that you put on your cereal, if you put sugar on your cereal, or if there's already sugar on your cereal, it's sucrose. It's a disaccharide made of two uh, monomers. Lactose is another one. That's the sugar that's found in milk uh, that, is, uh, that a mother would give to the child. Uh, that's a glucose and a galactose molecule stuck together. It is two monomers of uh, the, the carbohydrates. Sucrose and lactose are very common disaccharides. Again, their primary function is actually for storing energy. They can store twice as much energy as a monosaccharide. Then we have a third category of carbohydrates known as polysaccharides, meaning more than two of the monosaccharides are stuck together to produce polysaccharides. Common examples of uh, the polysaccharides include cellulose. Cellulose is actually thought to be the most common molecule of the biological world. There's more of this particular molecule in the, on this planet than there is any other biological molecule. It is the primary component in plants for making the, we the cell walls around the cells of a plant. It is what makes um, lettuce crunchy. Uh, it is what makes plant material crunchy and rigid. So the function of cellulose, and, and by the way, cellulose is made of many, 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 many monosaccharides put together by the thousands to create a very large molecule. Cellulose, the primary function of cellulose is actually to, uh, uh, for strength or structure. It gives form to a plant. It's why a plant stands up primarily because of cellulose. Another polysaccharide that is used for structure, for shape, for form, is uh, chitin. In animals, uh, there are some animals that will use, put together lots and lots of monosaccharides to build something called chitin. That's uh, what you find the uh, exoskeleton of an arthropod to be. Uh, if you uh, is the crunchiness of an ant, that external hard surface is made of chitin. Uh, if you also, if you eat a lobster, the part that you don't eat, the shell on the outside, is made of chitin. 
It's many, many monosaccharides put together to produce a structure uh, for, the, for the animal. Polysaccharides can also be used to store lots of energy. If you can store lots of energy, if you can store energy into a monosaccharide, even more into a disaccharide, then you can store an even greater amount in a polysaccharide. The common examples of polysaccharides for the purpose of energy are starch, and that's what plants use to store energy, and glycogen in animals. Uh, we will store, our livers will store lots of energy in the form of glycogen. So those are the carbohydrates, or an overview of that particular macromolecule. A second macromolecule found on, in organisms are the proteins. I like to summarize the proteins as really the shape molecules. If you need a molecule that has a particular shape, then it's almost certainly a protein that's designed to fulfill that function. If you need a molecule that produces a tube so you can take things in and out through it, then it's a protein that actually produces the tube. If you need a, uh, a key to go into a lock of a particular shape, it's going to be a protein that does that kind of thing. Anything that the cell, that the organism desires that requires a molecule of a particular shape, it's probably a protein that generates that shape. The monomer that produces all the proteins. By the way, the human body, we don't know the exact number, but we think it's somewhere around 120,000 different proteins in the construction of the human body. But all those 120,000 different kinds of proteins are made from only 20 amino acids. The amino acids are the monomers for the proteins. They can be uh, arranged in a large number of different arrangements to produce quite a variety of proteins. Proteins have all sorts of functions. Again, anything that requires a shape is uh, probably using a protein, and many things do require a shape. If, for example, you need inside a cell the ability to move an object from one place to another by lassoing it, by putting a rope around it and then pulling the rope in, well, the rope is probably going to be made of protein. And in fact, we have proteins that are cables, they're columns, they, uh, they're support structures that hold uh, organelles in the cell in their proper location. Uh, they're used as winches to pull things in. They're used if you want an oar, like stick things outside the cell and move those things so that the cell can swim through the water. If you've got those kinds of oars, the oars are made of protein. If you've got a whip that you're whipping the cell, sort of like a propeller that you're moving the cell through the water with, the propellers are made, these flagella are made of proteins. We have doors in the cell. We want to go from one place to the, in the cell to another, but we don't want to have it just wide open all the time. We want to be able to open and close it. Then the doors are made of proteins. We have um, organism, uh, we, we got molecules that are designed to carry other molecules, to hold on to molecules and do things with the, the molecule. For example, I've spoken of water being a great polar solvent. It can uh, carry in solution uh, molecules that have charges. But what about molecules that don't have charges? They're not going to stay in solution. They're going to come out of solution out of the water. Oil is going to separate from water and, and float on top of it. It doesn't want to have anything to do with it. There's actually molecules designed, protein molecules designed to grab onto nonpolar uh, molecules. The proteins themselves have charges and they dissolve very readily into water. So if you have a molecule that actually has an arm that can grab onto a nonpolar substance, this protein molecule can dissolve in water, thus holding the, the nonpolar substance in solution in water. So we have proteins that actually help uh, dissolve uh, indissolvable substances in water. We also have a large group of proteins known as enzymes. Enzymes are 
chemical catalysts. If you have a chemical reaction, uh, say you're adding A to B to get another molecule C out of the process, if you just threw A and B into the system, it might take, let's say it takes two days to accomplish this particular uh, result. A catalyst would be something that doesn't change the what's reacting, and it doesn't, in a direct sense, uh, get, um, get changed forever by the, 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 the reaction. And it's not really part of the reaction, but what it does is speed it up. So it, it's not going to change the fact that A and B become uh, C, it's only going to change the speed. So what would have normally taken two days might take only a few seconds. A catalyst speeds up a chemical reaction. Enzymes are catalysts for the kind of reactions that occur within organisms. And they speed up these chemical reactions usually by something along this line. Let's say you're going to speed up A and B going to C. A catalyst, an enzyme in that situation, might be one that's got one arm that can grab on to C. And um, B, sorry. It only grabs B. It only fits into B. The other arm fits only into A. And when B and A are in place, the protein molecule, the enzyme, is designed to automatically choom, moves those two pieces together so that they're close together. Then the chemical reaction occurs automatically between them. And as soon as C is produced, the enzyme releases A and B and uh, goes about looking for more A's and B's. In that process, you speed up the chemical reaction. Let's say you have the reverse situation. Let's say you have a reaction that starts with a substance that you want to break into two other substances. An enzyme in that situation might actually grab onto one side of the molecule with one arm, grab onto the other side of the molecule with the other arm, and as soon as both of those are in place, it, it stretches between those two arms, thus pulling the molecule apart and making the division of the molecule more rapid. Enzymes are extremely important. We think that there are something on the order of 100,000 or more enzymes in the body that are speeding up the chemical reactions that normally occur in the body. In instance after instance, as we've learned about these chemical reactions, we've learned that naturally these reactions actually occur very, very slowly. It actually takes days, years, sometimes decades for the process to occur naturally. But you throw in one of these enzymes and it occurs in seconds or minutes and it allows life to exist. If it wasn't for enzymes, we wouldn't be able to produce uh, all the chemical reactions that need to, need to happen in uh, organisms. A third macromolecule type uh, is called the nucleic acid group. Uh, nucleic acids include DNA and RNA. In fact, DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid. NA is nucleic acid. RNA is ribonucleic acid. The NA stands for nucleic acids. The purpose of nucleic acids is to carry genetic information. The monomers to build nucleic acid are called nucleotides. For DNA, there are four nucleotides, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and, and, uh, and thymine. And you make all your DNA, even though DNA has literally billions of these uh, nucleic acids, of these nucleotides, sorry, of these nucleotides strung together, there are only four of the nucleotides that they have to choose from. So from just four nucleotides, you can produce all the variety of DNA that we have in the world, basically every organism having separate DNA. Uh, but it's all built from just four nucleotides. RNA is built from four other nucleotides, uh, so it's a total of maybe as, much as, as many as eight uh, nucleotides that make up all the nucleic acids of the world. In the one case, in the case of RNA, 
the basic sugar that is in the, uh, in the nucleotide is ribose sugar. That's the monosaccharide that is part of the nucleotide. And so that's why it's called ribonucleic acid because it uses ribose sugar. The monomer of sugar that's in DNA monomers is uh, deoxyribose sugar. So that's why DNA is called deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA. A fourth group, the fourth group, the last group of major molecules of life are the lipids. These are the molecules that don't dissolve in water. Basically, how the best way to describe it. They are the nonpolar uh, molecules. They don't have electrical charges, or at least enough electrical charge for water to hold up this molecule in water. So these particular molecules separate from water or repel water. They are the waxes, the oils, the fats, and the steroids. Uh, these are nonpolar substances, meaning they don't have those electrical charges. They are hydrophobic. Their water, hydro is water, phobic is fear of. They seem to have a fear of water. They want to get away from water. They repel water. Mix oil and water together, they separate. Uh, you put a wax on a surface, put water on it, and water beads. It tends to stay off of that surface or get off of that surface. <clears throat> the monomers for lipids, a little more complicated. There are two major types of lipids. Uh, there are the, uh, uh, there's one group of lipids that their monomers are what are called fatty acids and glycerol. Fatty acids are basically a long string of carbons carbon to carbon, carbon to carbon to carbon, and then a bunch of hydrogens connected to the carbons. These are very long chains. They might be hundreds, thousands of carbons in length. That's a fatty acid. Glycerol is a three carbon molecule that grabs on to, in some cases, these fatty acids. And so you can have a, a lipid that has three fatty acids uh, together, connected through the glycerol, or you can have two fatty acids and another uh, molecule attached. Uh, that's how you build one group of lipids. A second group of lipids, the steroids, are built from cholesterol. Cholesterol is, is a substance with carbons in rings uh, and then hydrogens around that, uh, and the cholesterol is built are added to to produce these things known as steroids. The purpose of fatty acids, uh, the purpose of steroids and so on and so forth, the fatty acid based lipids, those that are made for, by fatty acids plus glycerol, there are two major groups here. There's one where you have two fatty acids and a phosphate group on the, uh, on the other, the third carbon of the glycerol. In that case, you end up with a phospholipid. It's got two fatty acids and a phosphate group, phosphate base group. This phosphate group, it has charges. So one end of the molecule actually has charges that attract water. One end of the molecule is water loving. The other end of the molecule doesn't want to have anything to do with water. And that's interesting. We're going to see what that does. It's a very special kind of molecule that we build the walls, uh, the membranes of cells from. Another group of fatty acid lipids are the triglycerides. They have three fatty acids coming off of the glycerol, and these are used to store lots of energy. These are the fats, uh, the fats in the body. Uh, they're used not just to store energy, but also to cushion the body. They surround the heart, so if uh, if you end up in a big impact and you, you stop really fast or something like that, your heart is, is going to bruise itself up against the uh, chest bone or something if it weren't cushioned. And in fact, the heart is covered with, with fat layers so that it doesn't get impacted so seriously. So it's used for cushioning. It's also used for insulation, fat layers 
in the skin, insulate our skins so that they, our bodies don't get too cold or too hot. Uh, there's two different types of triglycerides, those that have carbon, carbons that are connected by single uh, bonds and lots of hydrogen. Those are very straight and flexible uh, legs, if you wish. These, these fatty acid chains can be looked at as long legs. And if, they, if you've got uh, single bonds between carbons, you've only got one covalent bond between each carbon and lots of hydrogen associated with it. The legs are flexible. These are saturated fa fatty acids and they produce the things we know of as fats. The unsaturated fatty acids are those with, where the carbon every once in a while between carbons have as a double bond and those produce the things we know of as oils. So fats and oils are in this category. The last group of lipids are the steroids. These are the things built from cholesterol. These, are, these include such things as the sex hormones, progesterone, estrogen, and so on and so forth. These things are used as chemical messengers in the body. These are molecules that actually are able to enter cells without any permission. They can just go right through into, enter into any cell in the body, every cell in the body. So if you want to send a message to every single cell in the body, you use a steroid to deliver that particular message. Uh, this is what makes steroids so dangerous or why they have the effects they have, because they actually impact the entire body. So there we have the major types of macromolecules of life, carbohydrates, proteins, nucleic acids, and lipids. They're made from very few monomers. Only about six or so monosaccharides produce all the carbohydrates. Only 20 amino acids produce all the proteins. Only five nucleotides produce the nucleic acids. And a few fatty acids, glycerol and cholesterol, produce all the lipids. In just a few dozen, at most, monomers, you can produce all of the macromolecules of life. That is so cool and it's an interesting design because this means that every organism can actually be built of unique macromolecules that no other organism is made of. They can be completely unique, and we are, yet you can then uh, you can replace any one of those molecules if it gets damaged, by breaking it down and rebuilding it from simple monomers. The same monomers can be used to build every single molecule of our body. We can have millions of different molecules, but it's easy enough to replace them and repair them because they're all built from the same small number of my, um, monomers. Also, the process of digestion is really cool. If you eat another organism, a plant or an animal, it's got unique macromolecules that don't, are not like anything in our body. But if you take it into our body, break the macromolecules of that organism down into the monomers, we can use those monomers to build our molecules. So we can digest any organism, basically. We can break down any organism and build our own molecules from it. That's pretty cool. Also, every macromolecule of every organism can be biodegraded. If an organism dies, no matter what the organism is, decomposers can come in, break down that organism into monomers, and the monomers become nutrients for all the other organisms. So a, a decomposer can break down any organism into its monomers, regardless of how different that organism might be. Pretty cool design. And of course, the consequence of this is that decomposition doesn't just clean up the world of dead bodies, it also produces nutrients for other organisms because other organisms can take those monomers and build their own macromolecules. This is pretty cool. The fact that all the macromolecules of life can be uh, created from a few monomers looks like an incredibly uh, elegant design for life.